You just said I was going to ask you a question. Please put it out again so that I can ask it. <clears throat> <laughs> Why am I a Seventh-day Adventist? Why am I? Why are you? Why are you a Seventh-day Adventist? Well, uh, it's based upon the name. The name was chosen by our church in the 1860s uh, to represent what we believe. Uh, an Adventist is anyone who believes in the advent of Christ. Which is the second coming or first coming, depending on where you are in history. Could be either one. And uh, Seventh Day represents the day of worship that we try to honor. So uh, these are the reasons as far as our church is concerned. When I was baptized, we had to go through about 27 points and it seemed overwhelming for an 11 year old. I was really relieved later when I found out that there are only two points that uh, make it uh, necessary for me to be a Seventh-day Adventist. What are they? Uh, the first one is uh, if we accept what the Bible teaches on the condition of man in death. If we do, this automatically limits us down to just a handful of other churches. And then if we add to that with the belief in the Seventh-day Sabbath, uh, there's only one thing left to be, and that's the Seventh-day Adventist. So it's pretty simple. Just two points, mm -hmm. distinguishing. Uh, I also uh, like to remember that Jesus was a Seventh-day Adventist, and uh, all of the apostles were Seventh-day Adventists. The Apostle Paul was a Seventh-day Adventist. Uh, the, all the Bible characters were Seventh-day Adventists. So we have a lot of good company. Yeah, that's a, that's a good crowd you just named. Um, why would someone, because to, today there are many people, many Christians, who are not Seventh-day Adventists. Um, what do you suppose would, would uh, prevent or hinder a person from being a Seventh-day Adventist Christian? Well, I think that if a person hasn't done their homework or, or become aware of the truth of this matter, that that would, of course, be a hindrance. So a lack of knowledge or information, maybe in Scripture? Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, I suppose that peer pressure would be uh, one. Uh, uh, people don't like to be different, and the truth is uh, we as Seventh-day Adventists don't particularly enjoy being different, but uh, that can be a... Uh, uh, a reason, a peer pressure. Um, someone uh, brought up Billy Graham, and uh, I have to leave Billy Graham in God's hands. Uh, only God knows what truth he has understood or misunderstood. But when it comes to my experience, I know what truth I have understood, and that's important. What about the idea, perhaps, that some people um, haven't become Seventh-day um, observers or worshipers because they don't understand how God feels about that day? Um, not simply from a legal perspective in terms of being part of the Ten Commandments, that, but maybe they don't understand how He feels about the day, what it means to Him and what it means to relationship with him. I think that's true. I think that God's presence is very much in the Sabbath. I believe if we look for it, we will find a sense of his presence in that 24 hour period. That, that goes can, beyond. That you, that you cannot find in any other day. Uh, I believe that you can experience that. Um, Sort of like uh, being asked for a date, perhaps. Oh, I have a parable I want to use tonight. So don't go there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I'll look for that parable to come on then in the course of your, your presentation. Uh, I have one last question I think maybe I'd like to just bounce off of you, though. Is it possible to be a Seventh-day Adventist without being a Christian? Oh, sure. Sure. <clears throat> I, 
I, uh, that's a scary thought, but, you know, if I don't have a relationship with Christ, I can still be a member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Still even be looking for the second coming of Jesus. Yeah. Qualify by name. And keep the Sabbath in a sense. Um, we were over in Jerusalem on Sabbath, uh, looking out the window of our hotel, and we saw crowds of young people going up and down the street um, and looking at the movies that were advertised in the theaters so they'd know which one to go to after the sun went down. In Jerusalem? Yeah. <laughs> so they were just waiting for Sabbath to end so they could... And I'm afraid that's the experience of some Seventh-day Adventist young people. Yeah, uh, they, it's, it's not been an uncommon thing, I've, I've discovered, for uh, Seventh-day Adventists to want to know what time sun sets so that they can know when the fun can begin again. Or get behind a hill. Yeah, it went behind a hill, so it's, it's behind, down, it's down now. Or behind the garage. Turn the TV back on quick. Yeah. Yeah, well, thank God for VCRs. Yeah. Yeah. God help us. Well, give us some better reasons for considering Sabbath than perhaps some of those last ones. Okay. Johnny tripped down the front steps on his way to Sunday school one Sunday morning. He had two quarters, uh, one for the Lord and one for ice cream on the way home after church. And when he got to the curb, one of the quarters slipped and fell down the drain, and he felt very bad that the Lord's quarter had gone down the drain. <laughs> As he headed toward um, Sunday school, he met a friend of his who was going fishing. And uh, the friend said, come on and go fishing. Oh, no, he said, I have to go to Sunday school. Well, it's all right, and uh, your mother won't know. Come on. And uh, the day was so nice, and the friend was so persuasive that uh, Johnny went fishing. He was back home a little late, and he had some mud on his shoes, and it wasn't long before mother had the whole story. She said, Johnny, I will teach you to go fishing on Sunday. I want you to go to your room and read the fourth commandment. 50 times. So Johnny went to his room and read the fourth commandment. Here it is, Exodus 20, 8 to 11. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. Thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates, for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. He uh, made a mark as he finished, and uh, before he reached the 50 times, he had it memorized. And uh, he was very impressed, and he promised his mother that he would never forget. Several weeks went by, and... Uh, the teacher at school asked the uh, kids if they would uh, like to uh, repeat the days of the week. And Johnny raised his hand and stood up, and he uh, repeated the days of the week. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. The teacher said, fine, Johnny, you've got them in sequence, uh, but uh, you missed one thing. You started with uh, Monday, and you should start with Sunday. We don't do you want to try again? So he tried again. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. The teacher said, Johnny, didn't you understand? Please do as I tell you. And he started again. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And by this time, the teacher was getting very stern. And uh, she said, what is wrong with you? Johnny said, teacher, if you had read the fourth commandment as many times as I have, you would know that uh, Monday is the first day of the week and Sunday is the seventh day. The teacher gulped. 
and uh, hoped that when he got home, his mother would give him better answers. Well, this is a very real type of story and could very well have happened. And it makes a lot of sense that Johnny was doing some careful thinking based upon having done his homework. Now, where did the Sabbath come from? It did not come from Mount Sinai. It did not come from Abraham, who was the father of the Jews. The Sabbath began at creation. Genesis 2, 2 and 3. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made, and he sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work, which God had created and made. So God rested, blessed, and sanctified the seventh day in honor of creation. Major point. The Sabbath was given in honor of creation. In honor of the birthday of the world. Evidently, God saw that it was wise for people to have a weekly reminder that he was their creator and uh, give them something to think about on a special day. And then in addition to that, to have a special time with them in terms of relationship. Now, if we're going to uh, look at uh, the Bible definition or uh, proof of the Sabbath, we can use three major texts. I have seen this done by HMS Richards. He likens these three to posts in building a fence. And uh, the first one goes down, and then the next one goes down, and by that time you can sight along there and make room for the third one and have them perfectly in line. Notice these three fence posts. Revelation 1.10. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice. All right. Some people call Sunday the Lord's day. Well, uh, this doesn't say which day it was, but this first text reminds us that John understood that he was in the spirit on the Lord's day. So fence post number one, the Lord has a day. Fence post number two, Mark 2, 27 and 28. And he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. So from Jesus' own lips, we find out that the Lord's day is the Sabbath. Now, if we add to that what we've already read from the fourth commandment, there we have the reminder, the third post, the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. All right, the Lord has a day, that day is the Sabbath, and the Sabbath is the seventh day. And there we have the biblical evidence in three simple texts of the uh, existence of the Sabbath and what day of the week it is. Have you ever thought about it? The, uh, there is no astronomical reason for the week. The uh, day is caused by the turning of the earth on its axis. The uh, month is caused by the relationship of the earth to the moon and the year is caused by the traveling of the earth around the sun and it uh, travels around the sun in 365 days 5 hours 48 minutes and 46 seconds and it never varies a fraction of a second my father enjoyed this and uh, so he began telling us that uh, on his birthday that he had just made another trip around the sun. <laughs> One day I saw a special card and I bought it for him. It had uh, the sun and it had the earth going around. And it said the earth is sort of a scary place to live, but at least you have a trip around the sun every year. <laughs> so I gave it to him. 
But the week has no astronomical reason for its existence. The only reason for the existence of the week is creation. And the literal seven-day creation story. This is very interesting. This means that when the atheist or the evolutionist says it's Tuesday, the third day of the week, he is admitting in spite of himself in the reality of the week, the seven days of creation. And it's interesting if you study it through carefully and trace it back, the weekly cycle has never been broken. You can trace this back. We have the same calendar as far as the order of the days of the week are concerned as hung on the wall in the days of Christ when he was here. And we're told that Jesus kept the Sabbath. You can go further back from there, but that's kind of far enough for me. Because uh, if I keep the same day that Jesus kept, when I get to heaven, I think he'll, he'll accept that. And that uh, <clears throat> I'll be in good uh, stance concerning the day I worshiped on. Now let's notice that Jesus kept the Sabbath. Luke 4, verse 16. So he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. It was his custom to go into the synagogue on the Sabbath. And uh, he didn't necessarily find a welcome every time. Some people say, I... Uh, <clears throat> Don't like to go to church because I don't get anything out of it. Well, the only thing that Jesus got out of it one time was uh, being taken to a cliff to be thrown off the cliff. If anyone had a good reason to stay home from church on Sabbath, it would have been Jesus, wouldn't it? But he went. It was his custom. And he continued to follow this. Now some people say, how can we have a change of the Sabbath? Obviously, most people go to church on Sunday. So uh, can, can it be that this has been changed? Well, I'd like to remind you that uh, you cannot change anybody's birthday. Suppose I was go to, to you and, and I say, uh, your birthday is on uh, March 12th. We're going to change it to July 16th. You'd say, man... <laughs> Not even God himself can change your birthday. That's impossible. Neither can you change the birthday of the world. That's impossible. So uh, it just can't be done. We have tried to change the birthday of, was it Lincoln or Washington? I have forgotten, which also tells you how much I think about Lincoln and Washington. You know? Are you going to spend tomorrow <clears throat> sitting around meditating on Lincoln and Washington? So when we think that we can presume to change one of their birthdays, it must mean that they don't mean that much to us. And uh, yet it, it can't be done. It's impossible. Well, I have collected reasons for keeping Sunday. I have 22 reasons. My father used to present these reasons on the evangelistic stage. He had them on little banners that he would roll up and have them all across the stage. And he had a little string tied with a slip knot and these strings were hanging down. And it was always a mystery and a wonder to me to have him go over and pull a string and the banner would come rolling down. And he'd go down through all of the 22 reasons for keeping Sunday. Well, if you analyze them, uh, none of them hold water. They are very trivial and uh, synthetic reasons for keeping Sunday. Most of them are excuses for not worshiping God on Sabbath. But uh, probably the usual reason that most people give for worshiping on Sunday is that it's in honor of the resurrection. At first glance, that sounds nice. But uh, it's not biblical. There is something already in honor of resurrection. <clears throat> Pastor Lee told about it the other day. Baptism. 
is in honor of the resurrection, dying and rising in newness of life with Christ. So there's no biblical reason for it, but it's probably one of the best sounding reasons that seem to appeal to a lot of people. My father heard that there was a preacher of another church that was going to give his reasons for worshiping on Sunday, so he went to hear him. And this preacher said, Sunday is not the Sabbath. He says, it burns me up to hear people calling Sunday the Sabbath. It is not the Sabbath. Saturday is the Sabbath. And if you want to keep Sabbath, then you are keeping one of the gloomiest days of all the week. That was the day that Jesus was dead in the tomb. But I worship on Sunday because this is the most important and the greatest day of all the week when Jesus rose from the grave. Well, uh, I guess people thought that was pretty good, at least in his congregation. But uh, look at it for a moment. When Jesus was asleep in the tomb, he had already said the words, it is finished. Which meant that the devil was finished and that the whole plan of salvation was set in cement. It was all accomplished what he'd come to do. And his torture and his pain and his broken heart were all past as he slept peacefully in the tomb. It was one of the most glorious days of all the week. Uh, was it any problem? Uh, did God worry about whether he could get him out of the tomb on Sunday morning? Not at all. Probably one of the easiest things that God ever did was to give Jesus permission to rise out of that tomb. So there's no reason to feel bad and sorry and call it a gloomy day. It was a wonderful day. And Jesus gave a special meaning to the Sabbath by adding to it his own experience of going to the tomb. Well, as I remember these banners that came down, my father finally dropped the, the last banner. Well, I think he kept it in the middle, saved it for last. It was the Bible reason for the attempted change of the Sabbath. It's found in Daniel 7, verse 25. He shall speak great words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall think to change times and laws. This is referring to a power that was depicted in prophecy and which Martin Luther and many other biblical scholars from other years identified as the papacy. The papacy has admitted doing this. You can read it in their catechisms. And so this papal power that came along tried to change God's times and laws. The only commandment in God's law that has to do with time is the fourth commandment. And uh, this is the biblical reason well, uh, when you study Daniel and put together with, with Revelation, you find out how God feels about this power and about this attempt to change. And uh, he feels very deeply about it. We've already noticed that uh, there's a, one of the greatest warnings in all scripture against the beast in his image and the mark and the number of his name and the uh, historical and prophetical interpretation that we have known for a long time is still true. Although we tried to see the experiential in these three angels the other night, but the historical and prophetic are still true and they make it very clear how God feels about this power that uh, thought they could change his law and his day. It can't be changed. My father and uncle in their public meetings as they would go down through the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation, would have people tell them, many times they were told, 
We have always known that the seventh day is the Sabbath, according to Scripture. But we never knew how God feels about it. And when we have found out now how God feels about it, that makes a big difference. And that means we're going to accept the day in honor of creation. Well, here's another interesting statement. In the, uh, in the book of Hebrews, we uh, found that the Sabbath was represented as a rest. That the key word in the Sabbath is rest. And there remains a rest, God said, for the people of God. He was referring to the people of God on their way from Egypt to the promised land. And he invited them to enter into his rest. Well, what rest is this? If you check the context, the first part of Hebrews 4, you find that it was the rest from trying to transform our lives and sanctify ourselves. God has promised to transform our lives and change our lives for us. And uh, the Sabbath becomes a symbol of this. Rest. It's a symbol of sanctification. Notice this in Ezekiel 20, verse 12. Moreover, I also gave them my Sabbath to be a sign between them and me that they might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. Notice Exodus 31, 13. Same idea. Speak also to the children of Israel, saying, Surely my Sabbath you shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. What does that mean? It means that we can cease from our own efforts to get victory and overcoming <clears throat> and to sanctify ourselves and enter into rest as we let God do that. Well, that is hard work. We've noticed this. It requires surrender. It's hard work. But it is still the invitation from Jesus. We have a hard time accepting a gift. In terms of salvation, as well as in terms of just regular day-by-day -day experience. I have a little piece that was written by Debbie Anfinson Vance that is entitled The Trouble with Grace A Tough Truth for Nice People Grace can be a problem The Bible in fact brims with unsettling stories that show how grace again and again upsets the apple cart as we know it Big brother stews when dad throws a party for a money-grubbing runaway who down on his luck has come home. Full-time employees grumble when the boss pays all his part-time workers a whole day's wage. Ninety-nine sheep are left at risk while the shepherd searches for one that is lost. Now, I might find these stories funny, even useful, if I happen to be the runaway son, the part-time worker, or the one lost sheep. But a high-achieving, denominational, educated, and church-employed person can hardly be typified in such terms. There's too much of the old-time religion coursing through my conscientious good kid veins. So I catch myself sympathizing with the elder brother the full-time worker, and the 90 and 9, even though I've heard these stories 70 times, 7 times, and know the punchline like mother's voice. Good people who take this seriously <clears throat> have a real problem. For some years now, I have prided myself on not being a legalist, whatever that is, the trouble with grace is that it doesn't have room for me to get uppity about anything I am or am not, and is pretty much blind to the names I call myself. Which brings me to another point. Grace is troublesome not only to the legalist or religious person. Grace can be tough stuff even for ordinary, nice people to stomach. 
And if you want to go one further, I will say this. There is something about human nature in general that makes it hard for any of us to hold out an empty hand. Because if we did, grace would fill that hand. And what could be more troublesome than that? Gifts are a problem to us. We are disciples of the make your own way, pull your own weight system. We are capable, self-reliant, high achieving, and we are guilty. We believe deep down that uh, we don't deserve anything we haven't worked, suffered, or paid for. And we narrow our eyes at the free lunch crowd. For all of our talking about giving, more often than not, we mix the reality with trade and uh, obligation. It embarrasses us to take a gift. It gives us a place to worry. Accepting an out and out gift is tantamount to charity, which from childhood, nice people have learned is good to give and bad to take. But if light people have difficulty taking grace as the gift for it is, we also have trouble with the way it turns our good order on its head. We believe in the white hats and the black hats, and we don't like the way grace seems to mix them all up. And more often than not, let the wrong hat ride off with the princess into the sunset, while Mr. Deserving stands sniffling alone at the unfairness of it all. There is something untamed about a God who would sponsor that sort of end to the show. It is obvious that we have not yet successfully civilized him to our sense of justice and propriety. I could mention many more problems that grace poses, but I'm going to stop here and go instead to another story Jesus told. Even Jesus admitted that grace could be problematic. Here's the story. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch will pull away from the garment, making the tear worse. Neither do men pour new wine into old wineskins. If they do, the skins will burst, the wine will run out, and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins, and both are preserved. So in the meeting of old and new, we may recognize that the trouble with grace is the trouble with us. We are old shirts for new cloth, old vessels for new wine, too proud for the gift. But grace also comes to elder brothers, and with it a choice. We may hold tight to life as we think it should be, cling to what makes us believe we are good. Or we can follow the hard and apparently senseless words, whoever tries to keep his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life will preserve it. And open ourselves to grace, believing it will give us something beyond the shredded rags and the burst containers, though we haven't the foggiest idea what that will be. And I myself cannot say what that will be, because it is the nature of grace to surprise. One more thing I can say, we who let go of our righteousness and lose our lives will gain a new view of those unsettling stories. We will see ourselves lost in a herd of 90 and nine, prodigal in our elder brotherliness and chronically late to our full-time jobs. Then we may know a shepherd, a father, a generous boss. We may find our lives and laugh at the unexpectedness of it all. For as surely as we know ourselves lost, we shall be found, found by a grace whose business is not to make good folks better, but to search out wandering ones and take them home, take them home to a party. I think that is a classic. And uh, it simply demonstrates in very interesting terms that we have a tough time accepting a gift. Some people have a hard time accepting the gift of justification. And so they have spent needless hours and painless uh, efforts, painful efforts, to try and work out their own salvation and to pay their own debt. We've had pilgrimages. We've had people who lie on beds of spikes. We've had all kinds of evidence that people have a hard time accepting the gift of justification. We were standing in uh, the Cairo Museum and we were looking at the relics of King Tut. And as you know, the Egyptian kings 
bought their way into the afterlife with uh, millions of dollars worth of gold. You can't believe all of the gold of even King Tut, who was a young king, let alone the older kings, trying to earn their way and to buy their way into the afterlife, the next world. And as we stood there, my son was standing beside me, and he said, it's too bad they didn't read John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave. He gave. It's a gift. You don't earn it. You don't buy it by gold. It's a gift. What a hard time we have to learn that. But even if we get the good news of justification, that we don't have to earn our forgiveness or our standing before God, we have a hard time accepting sanctification as a gift. We keep trying hard to change our own lives, to be victorious and to overcome, and to keep the commandments. And so we enter into failure. We were having a uh, retreat at, uh, in Arkansas where we live. <clears throat> we live one mile from the foot of Whitney Mountain. <clears throat> and you can go another mile up to the top of Whitney Mountain. I've had a lot of fun telling my California friends that I climb Mount Whitney every day. Um, <clears throat> what I'm talking about is Whitney Mountain. Up at the top of Whitney Mountain is a, a beautiful view of uh, Beaver Lake, which is a beautiful lake, 500 miles of shoreline. And that's one of the reasons we build a house back there. And uh, there's a lodge and there's a restaurant and there are uh, places for people to, to stay. And so we have held a number of weekend retreats there, spiritual retreats, uh, should be called advances. And uh, <clears throat> one weekend we had about 40 people and we were talking about these things, the good news of the gospel and the gift. There's someone there who was an alcoholic. He had been with our faith years before, but he was an alcoholic, hopeless. But somebody had invited him and had brought him to the weekend retreat. After the weekend was over, Sunday noon, I was walking down the steps to leave and this man was standing there at the bottom of the steps. And uh, he looked at me and he said, uh, well, I wish, I wish I could uh, start over, but uh, I have started over too many times and I can't do it again. I said to him, started over on what? Oh, he said, uh, started over trying to stop my drink. I said, weren't you listening this weekend? Drink is not your problem. It's God's problem. You can substitute anything else you want there. It is not our problem, it's God's problem. God has never asked us to fight the devil and our problems, never. And I said to him, uh, your problem is that you have been trying to fight your problem, which God has promised to handle for you, instead of seeking him and letting him have permission to take it. He said, really? I said, yes. I said, do you have a Bible at home? Yes. Do you have the book, Desire of Ages and the Life of Christ? Well, I think so, somewhere. I said, could you spend a, th a half hour each morning seeking God by reading something of Jesus and going to your knees and the best you know how, turn your life over to him? Well, he said, I guess I could. I said, uh, why don't you do it? He said, what happens if I fail, if I fall again? I said, nothing happens. God doesn't go anywhere. He doesn't leave you. We don't leave our children or our babies when they make mistakes. We keep on being their parents. Why would God treat us any different than earthly parents do their children? So I said, uh, when you fall, keep right on going. Keep right on seeking Jesus day by day. Keep giving him permission to do his work in your life. And he will do that. He doesn't leave you. 
He'll continue to stay with you. And uh, he said, okay, I'll try it. The following year, we had another retreat. He came this time bringing someone else with him. And he came to me and said, you're right. That's the way it works. If I keep in touch with Jesus, he gives it to me as a gift. What a lesson to learn. Beautiful. Well, uh, let's uh, take a look at this little parable, <clears throat> which uh, represents Jesus. I was in love with a beautiful girl, and I thought she liked me too, but I had a problem. The only opportunity for us to be together for some special time was once a week. The first time we made arrangements for this special occasion, I told her that I would arrive at her house just as the sun was setting, and the sky was all beautiful and purple. I thought that would be romantic. So I came up the front steps at the very moment I had told her that I would come, anxious to see her. I knocked on the door. Her little brother came to the door. Where's your sister, I asked. Oh, he said, I think she's in the shower. Well, you can come in and wait if you want to. So I sat down and waited. After a while, she came through the house, headed toward the kitchen. Her hair was all wet and up in curlers. As she went past me, she said a quick hello and then disappeared into the kitchen. This was rather disappointing. She seemed to be doing something out there in the kitchen with an iron, an ironing board, preparing something for the next day. I heard the oven door open and shut and some pots and pans rattling around. I began to wonder if she was very anxious to see me after all, but I continued waiting. And after a while, some of the other members of the family came in. She came out of the kitchen, introduced us, and said, maybe we can sit down and get acquainted. But her little brother said, when are we going to eat? After a bit of discussion, they decided we would eat first, so we went to the table and sat down. After supper, someone said, now why don't we go into the family room and get acquainted with our guests? And someone else said, do we have to? Well, I didn't feel too good about that, but we went into the family room anyway and began to talk. I noticed that several of them were terribly sleepy, including the young woman whom I was most interested in. In fact, she was nodding and yawning. Little brother finally went to sleep right while we were talking. My weekend with this young woman's family was off to a poor start. I guess you can sympathize with me. She apologized and said, listen, I had an awful lot to do this week and I'm sorry. I wasn't ready for your coming, but things will be better tomorrow. We've made some special plans. My heart began to pick up and I began to feel better. I went to bed with a picture in my mind of us going to some quiet place where we could really communicate and get to know each other better. The next day it turned out that she had planned for a group of friends to get together and go out into nature. At first I looked forward to it, but then I found out that all of her friends were bringing their motorcycles. We went out in nature all right, but you couldn't even talk about the roar of the engines out there in the forest. Finally, noontime came, we sat down for a picnic lunch. She seemed to be very tired, and as soon as we finished eating, she and her friends spread their blankets out under the trees and had a siesta. There was no time to talk then. I found myself walking in the woods all by myself. I loved the woods, but I hadn't planned to be alone like this. I spent most of the afternoon walking in the woods, feeling very lonely. Finally, I returned to the group. They were awake now. As I approached, I could hear them talking. I overheard my friend saying to some of them that she could hardly wait until I left because she had some exciting plans for that evening as soon as I was gone. I left that weekend sad and disappointed because, you know, it's terrible to love someone who really doesn't care that much about you. I have an interesting heritage. Grandpa Nels... <coughs> came over from the old country, Norway, along with his brothers, Knut and Uli and Martin. <laughs> they settled in Wisconsin. Soon after, he married Christine. And they began to uh, try and farm and make a living. They decided to move to northern Wisconsin where it looked uh, better. And so they did very well. They built a house and a barn. They had cattle and cows. And then one day a terrible fire came through. You can still read about it in the annals of Wisconsin history in the late 1890s. And uh, 
This fire was horrendous. It just ate up the country, burned the fields, burned the forests. People tried to spare their lives by lying in the creeks with just their noses out. Many people did lose their lives. The fire came to Grandpa Nelson's place, burned down the house, burned down the barn, the cattle, the horses. They ended up down by a little spring where the fire was coming in from every direction. It looked like they were done for. The uh, men put the women and children underneath blankets and then they took buckets and brought water from the spring and doused it over the blankets to help them keep them from suffocating. And then the spring went dry. And their empty buckets were sitting there. The men crawled under. And Grandpa Nels made some promises. He said, God, if you'll spare my life and my family, I promise you I will do anything you want me to do. I'll go anywhere you want me to go. The wind changed. They got out from underneath the blankets. The buckets were full of water. They took the buckets and doused the blankets again and uh, their lives were spared. Grandpa and Elf started over again the best they could. They began to try and get a place to live. Grandpa began reading his Bible. As he read his Bible, starting with Genesis, he came to Exodus 20, 8 to 11. They were Lutherans. As he read the account of uh, the fourth commandment, he said to his uh, wife, Christine, uh, what day is the seventh day of the week? She said, Saturday. Well, he said, what day is Sunday? She said, the first day of the week. Dummy. (coughs) However they say it in Norwegian. (laughs) He said, we've been worshiping God on the wrong day. She said, you're crazy. But the very next Sabbath, Grandpa Nels began worshiping God on Sabbath. Would you like to see a picture of him? (coughs) Grandpa Nels. There he is. Good old Grandpa Nels. That was when he was 44 years old, just uh, six months before he died. Well, uh, news got around. One day, a group of Adventist families were headed with their teams and wagons, headed west. They came to those parts, and they stopped at the fence and asked some farmers, are there any Seventh-day Adventists around here? And the farmer said, what's that? They told him. They said, yes, there is a man by the name of Nels Venden. And they gave directions to his place. These people drove into his yard as the sun was just going down Friday night. Grandpa came out to meet them. They said, is your name Venden? Yes. Are you a Seventh-day Adventist? Nels, Grandpa Nels said, what's that? He invited them in to stay. They had supper. After supper, they gathered around the table and these people began to study with Grandpa Nels about the Sabbath and about what God felt like concerning it in Daniel and Revelation. Christine was over in the corner knitting. She had never knitted so fast in her life. (laughs) But she couldn't help but hear what was going on. And uh, pretty soon she went over and joined them and began to study. And that weekend, both Grandpa and Grandma Nels became Seventh-day Adventists. I have always been proud of my heritage because uh, he did his own homework and followed his own convictions, regardless of what anyone else was doing. 
Later they moved to uh, Oregon or Washington across the Columbia River. White salmon, trout lake. Later they moved down to Mount Pleasant overlooking the Columbia River. My father was nine years old when his father died. And uh, we've gone there to the grave and have thought about it. My dad has told us how that uh, when he had to go to school the next week after the funeral and look out the window into the cemetery where his father was lying, it was almost more than he could bear. He told about his heart breaking when they uh, were throwing the dirt down on the casket in the ground. But before he died, Grandpa Nels called his children one by one. There were five boys and two sisters. He called them one by one like the old patriarchs in the Bible to his bedside and he asked them to promise to meet him in the better land. And they promised and my father and uncle became preachers and tried to share the good news across the country. Please, neighbor, do your own homework. Don't go by what other people are doing. And follow your own convictions. And you will know an experience in a relationship with God that is deeper and better. Beside him, where once I used to wait to be filled with strength and wisdom for the battles of the day, I might have passed him by again, but I clearly heard him say, I miss my time with you. Moments together. I need to be with you each day, and it hurts me when you say you're too busy, busy trying to serve me. But how can you serve me when your spirit's empty? There's a a part of you it's true I miss my time with you what do I have to offer how can I truly care my efforts have is not there but you'll provide the power if I take time to pray you'll be right there beside me you'll never have to say I miss my time with you those moments together I'm in.
Lord Jesus, thanks for setting aside time for us, for even designating a day each week where we can especially grow close to you, and for putting in that day a reminder that uh, we can rest from trying to be victorious over the things that trouble us and even turn that over to you as well. Please forgive us for not being nearly as interested in uh, seeking you as you have been in seeking us. Please prompt us to respond out of gratitude and love to your invitation for rest and fellowship in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.